For those of you who are taking notes, or those of you who are taking notes at home, I want you to write down, yeah, yeah, good. Star student right up front there. I want you to write this down, write in your journal, this sentence. Real love tells the truth about God. Real love tells the truth about God. But before we get into that a little deeper, I just want to ask, do any of you have any cool April Fool's jokes planned? For a co- you got one planned? You need some? Anybody need help with suggestions for April Fool's jokes? Ah. So my philosophy of April Fool's jokes is you only do it like every four or five years, something like that, but you do it up really big, you know, make it, that way you kind of lull them to sleep, whoever your loved one is, they're not expecting it, and then bam. So for instance, in uh, 2007 or so, I was leading a youth group in Detroit, and we had this guy named Jonathan. And Jonathan was super straight-laced, did all the right stuff, made good decisions, had great uh, grades in school. He was on the core team of our youth group, so he was always setting up and taking down. He was just a really good kid. Everybody loved him and respected him, and uh, he's one of those guys, like Paul, right? Everybody loves him, respects him. Yeah, yeah, just like that. (laughs) So a couple of his friends were at the church. It was April Fool's, and I thought, I'll just, I'll just try something. I'll just kind of make up a story, just see where it goes. So I'm making this story up as we go along. And I say to two of his best friends, and I'm, again, I'm just making this all up as I talk. I'm like, this girl came to the church the other day. It's, it's the weirdest thing. And she seemed really angry. She's like banging on the front door of the church. And uh, she's like about this tall short brown hair, and they're like, oh yeah, maybe that's, maybe that's Jennifer from school, or oh, maybe that's Emily he's talking about. Like, yeah, yeah, maybe that, maybe Emily, okay. But, but she's banging on the door, and she's angry, and she's yelling for Jonathan. Does that sound right to you? Like, she's just screaming, she's mad, and, and they're like, well, I don't know, I mean, I guess they're friends or something. And I said, is Emily pregnant? And I just left it there, <laughs> just left it there, and they freaked out, like lost it. What? Jonathan would, no, no, it can't be. It can't be. Literally, one of the guys ran downstairs to the youth room and almost cried. He was so shaken up by this whole thing, which means the joke was working perfectly. (laughs) Exactly how I planned it. And eventually, you know, after a few hours or so, I don't remember, I told them, you know, what day is it? April Fool's. But um, it worked really well. I was pleased. I was impressed with myself. Jonathan loved it too, by the way, when he heard, out, when he heard about it. But here's the thing. Sometimes in our lives, we actually tell an April Fool's joke about God. We do things as Christians that put out a lie about who God is and what God's about. We do that. Now, once again, I want you to have a meaningful life, and love is foundational to that. Real love is at the core of having a meaningful life, and to understand what that love looks like, we have to look at the life of Jesus. So to unpack this idea um, and look at how real love tells the truth about God, we're going to look at a story between Jesus and a rich guy that is absolutely bananas. It's so crazy when you dig deep into it and look at what's actually going on. But first, before we get into that, let's just bow our heads and pray. Father, we just invite you to be here, to work in our hearts, to open up our minds and hearts to what you would have to say. We pray that you would help us to listen and let the word just go deep into our hearts Give us a bedrock and a foundation that would help us to really love people and show them what you're like. In Jesus' name, amen. So our story takes place in Mark chapter 10. If you've got a Bible on your phone or you're taking notes, Mark chapter 10, verse 17 through 27. We're going to kind of go through it slowly, okay? So first couple of verses say this. 
Mark 10, as Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, whoa, busy. There we go. Distracting me. By the way, they're putting in our sound system back there, so yeah, it's a jackhammer. Yeah, let's do jackhammer Wednesday night. That'll go good. Uh, as Jesus was starting on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down, and said, "Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life?" So the guy is asking, "What do I have to do to get eternal life?" Which is an important question, right? It's a really important question for all of us to think about. Here's the problem. It was kind of stupid for him to ask. And the reason it was kind of stupid for him to ask is because everybody already knew what the answer was at that time. It's actually similar to the answer most Americans would give. So the answer, even if it's wrong, but the answer that all, most people would think is that, first of all, how do you get to heaven? They would say, follow the law of God, follow God's law, which tells us how to be a good person, and if you're a good person, then you're good to go. Americans would say something like, you know, be a good person, or do more good than bad, or maybe, well, I haven't done anything really bad, I haven't murdered anybody, so I should be good to go to heaven. It's a huge percentage whenever this question is asked in surveys about Americans. Then the second question would be, well, how do I know if I'm making God happy. And the answer back then would be, you would be blessed. God would be blessing you. This guy is rich, so he must be doing something to make God happy. Americans would, to some extent, agree with that. Well, if you're living a good life, then you should have good things. You know, God should bless you. God should make you happy. So that's what they would have believed. He's rich. He follows the law, God's blessing him. Why ask the question in the first place? And then Jesus, true to form, says something really confusing. Okay, check out this next verse. Why do you call me good? What? Jesus asked, only God is truly good. You ever ask someone a question and have them answer with a question? Your parents do that or something like that? Oh. Now, let's just unpack this a little bit. Why do you call me good? Only God is good. Now, there are other places where Jesus says he is God. All right, that's an important tenet in the Christian faith, that Jesus is the Son of God, he is God. So he's not saying, I'm not God. But why does he ask that? He's saying something like this. This is really important. If you're asking me this critical question about eternity, we need to figure out who you think I am. Okay? So like you're asking this question about how to have eternal life. Do you think the answer is coming from a man or just some guy? Or do you believe the answer is coming from God? Do you believe that my words represent the words of God? I mean, if real love tells the truth about God, it is really important to know what's true about God. And if you've grown up in church, you think, well, obviously, the Bible tells us about God, right? So that's how we learn about God. But it sounds simple enough. I'm not sure if we actually apply that to our lives. So let me, let me give you this example, because I... I try to pay close attention to, it's just this weird thing about me. I pay close attention to how people come up with their beliefs. What your process is for coming up with what you believe. And the best I can tell, it's something like ordering a burrito at Chipotle. Okay? Does anybody like Chipotle? Any Chipotle fans? A little bit. A little bit. You've all been there, right? There's no one here who's so sheltered. <laughs> You're like a Chipotle homeschooler. Sheltered. I'll take, I'll take you there. <laughs> At Chipotle, you get a tortilla, and then you pick and choose what to put on it, right? You pick what salsa, you pick what meat, you pick all these different things. And this is exactly how we're taught to come up with our beliefs. Like, we're looking at all the different options, all the different teachings, and like, well, I like that, I like that. Um, this karma thing, that sounds cool. This whole say a prayer and get to go to heaven, that sounds cool. Throw in a little Harry Potter magic, that would be cool, 
right? That's probably true. And then we just put it all together to create your belief. And in America, that's actually celebrated. It's like being your authentic self, you know, being true to yourself, what works for you. But it's fascinating to watch how this approach plays out in our lives, especially when there's beliefs that clash in how you choose which one to hold. So for instance, God says he designed sex to be between a man and a woman in marriage. But God, half the shows I watch disagree. Half my friends disagree. Ariana Grande disagrees. What am I supposed to do? Right? Or Jesus says, it's a tough one. Brace yourselves. Rachel knows. Jesus says, my teaching about wrong and right is more important than your political party's teaching about wrong and right. Now, here's a couple of things that we do when it comes to political parties. And, and I'm never going to take sides up while I'm preaching on behalf of the church, but I can talk in generalities. Here's something we do. We either think that our political party is so closely tied to the Bible that we don't even question it. We just assume that everything they believe is in lockstep with the Bible. It must be. How could, how could it not be? Or we do the opposite extreme, which is where we see something in the political party that doesn't match up with the Bible, and we go, I'm going to take the political party. I'm going to take that side. I mean, after all, we love our political parties in this country, don't we? So what do I do? Jesus says, if you pattern your life after the rhythms of rest and work that I'm showing you, you'll experience this joy and peace that you could have never imagined. And we said, well, but, but Jesus, if I'm off my phone for five minutes, the world will pass me by. Right? All my friends will talk. I won't know what's going on in the conversation. I'll be out of the loop. I won't know the news. I won't know the gossip. What am I supposed to do? Or maybe like, what, Jesus? Take a day off. I need to work. I need to work, work, work. How am I going to make money? How am I going to be respected? How am I going to achieve my dreams? The problem with picking and choosing our own truths is that it leaves us jumbled and confused and frustrated in trying to put together a foundation for our lives. There's an author, his name's Kurt Vonnegut, writes a book called Breakfast of Champions, and he, he writes this in the book. The things other people have put into my head, at any rate, do not fit together nicely, are often useless and ugly, are out of proportion with one another, are out of proportion with life as it really is outside my head. Can anybody relate to that? Do you ever feel that sense of confusion and frustration? Different things you're hearing out of proportion in your head? Jesus says, before we have the conversation of what truth you believe, first we need to figure out who you think I am. Because if you really think that Jesus is God, then the implication is, is that believing the culture over Jesus, believing Ariana Grande over Jesus, believing your political party when it's at odds at Jesus, all those things are choosing something over God. Then God finally get, or Jesus finally gets to the answer to the man's question. So check out this passage. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Don't cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. It's interesting, that, that one about honor your father and mother, it's always mixed up in a bunch of like big, serious things, which means it's big and serious. It's a little bit of a tangent, but there are ways to honor your father and mother, even if they're crazy. If they're not crazy, it should be easier. If they are crazy, there are ways to do it. Teacher, the man replied, I have obeyed all these commandments since I was young. This is awesome. Phew, good. Okay. I have obeyed God's laws. Check. I'm a good guy. I'm rich. It proves it. Check. 
But Jesus isn't done. And again, true to Jesus, he's about to drop a truth bomb. So let me ask you, when you drop a truth bomb, right? You hear some sort of argument and you know the answer. It's going to be so good. You just can't wait to put your mom and dad in their place, or your teacher in their place, or your sibling in their place. So tell me, like, what, what goes on inside your mind when, when you know you're going to drop that truth bomb? How does that feel? Yeah, powerful? What else? You want to scream it? <clears throat> Something like that? What else? Sweet, sweet. It's, it's a win-lose thing, right? You're about to lose. Here we go. Somebody give me the microphone. Somebody give me a microphone so I can drop it after this. It's an American thing. Don't worry about it. Or I just made it up, and it really doesn't make sense. Anywho, if I'm honest, when I've got a really good truth bomb to drop on someone, I feel a little arrogant, a little arrogant, you know? I feel like I'm kind of a big deal. It doesn't always turn out that way, but. So Jesus is about to drop a truth bomb on this guy. And look at what the first sentence this passage says. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. Isn't that interesting? When Jesus is about to express the truth about God, he does it with real love for this man. Real love tells the truth about God. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him and said, there's still one thing you haven't done. Some translations say there's still one thing you lack. And if you're a rich guy, you're thinking to yourself, what is it? I'm going to buy it. I got my visa, tell me where to go, what to purchase, whatever I lack, let's do it. I'm gonna have it. Then Jesus says, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor. Now think about that for a minute. There's one thing you lack. Now go sell everything. But Jesus, if I go sell everything, there'll be lots of stuff I lack like everything. If you do this, you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad. That word in the Greek for sad means like grieved, like torn up inside. Uh, almost, it, it's a word that you would use if somebody died, like sorrow over a death. He walked away Sad, for he had many possessions. Now, here's a tough question, but you're a smart group, so let's see what you come up with. What is the truth that Jesus is teaching us about God by what he's saying here? And there's a lot of things, so. What is Jesus teaching us about God in the passage? Come up with any? Yeah. Yeah, so God, God pushes us out of our comfort zone, you know, like he's gonna call us to do things that don't make sense. Yeah, and if you really love him, you, you jump. It's good. Any others? You know, Jesus knows that the man is about to walk away from him because he can see the future, which means God loves people who will reject him. What else? Is, is God showing any concern for how rich the guy is? No. In fact, God's much more concerned about the poor taking care of the poor. So everything about wealth and status that this world looks at and says successful, Jesus is saying, give it all up. What's important to God is caring for the poor. Now, 
if you're getting nervous at this point, this command about giving everything up is really mostly for people who rely on money, who have more faith in money than faith in God. So most Americans aren't like that, right? We don't have to worry about that. <laughs> what else? And that's exactly what Jesus is saying about God is that God wants us to live in a place of faith in him and not faith in money. That's the step. Jesus is showing real love to the rich man because his life tells the truth about God. And see, that's the tragedy that happens when we stop listening to Jesus' voice and put together our own belief burrito. Is that our lives stop showing others the truth about God. We lose our ability to really love people, and maybe we even start to consider walking away from the faith. And if we're honest, there's some of you who are already thinking about that. You're thinking, when I graduate, I'm done with this church thing, Maybe I do it just because, you know, my parents make me or something like that. If you ever walk away from Jesus, you will literally be turning your back on the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father through me. And then he said, I'll prove it by dying and raising again three days. Now, if you've been at church a lot, you're kind of tuning me out at this point because you're like, yeah, 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 I've heard that a hundred times. Move on to the next thing, okay? But let's just talk about this for a minute because it's really important. I want to drive this home a little bit. Jesus says, I'm God, I'm the son of God. I'm going to prove it by dying and raising again in three days. If somebody were to say that, you'd be like, you're crazy unless they actually did it. Then you probably have to pay attention to them. But Jesus, Ariana Grande and all my favorite pop stars disagree with you. Jesus, my political party say that I have to do this and not what you do in order to be a good person. But Jesus, there are people who say they follow you and they were really mean to me. Jesus, there's so many religious leaders. How do I know that you're the one? I mean, how do I know that I just don't believe in you because I grew up in a certain home or in a certain country? Scientists, Jesus, scientists can't prove that you died and rose again. Guess what? Jesus' death and resurrection does not fit into any scientific experiment. No miracle does. But... There are over 500 people who saw it happen. And many of them, including people that didn't, weren't writers of the Bible, wrote down an account of what they saw. Secondly, there are many people who have claimed to be God. In fact, there's some in Ben that think they're God, believe it or not. And there are many people who impacted the world in a really, uh, really influential way, like changed the course of world history. But there's only ever been one who claimed to be God, impacted the world, and proved it. Just that should give you pause if you're not sure about Jesus. If you ran into people who said they followed Jesus and were mean to you, guess what? They weren't really loving you because they weren't telling you the truth about God. That doesn't represent God at all. You have to be able to separate that in your mind and heart. Your political party changes its views about every two weeks. I don't know if you've noticed this yet. It is exhausting to try to keep up with what they want, what they think is right. And your favorite artist or your favorite actor or actress, your favorite celebrity, even if it's Ariana Grande. Guess what? God loves those people so much and they don't know any more than you about this kind of stuff. And if we build our lives on what the culture says we should believe, it's gonna fall apart. It's not gonna work. 
So the challenge is tonight to kind of clean off the belief burrito and come before Jesus and say, all right, let's start with your voice. Let's start there. Let's start there. I just want to talk about a couple ways that we could do this. And then I want to show you a quick video and we'll be done. So how do we do this? How do we learn the truth about God through Jesus? First of all, ask this question. Where do my beliefs come from? Don't assume you know. In fact, most of the time when I ask people to ask this question, they don't know. They just believe these things. They don't know where they came from. Might have come from a talk show. Might have come from a Disney cartoon. Might have come from, I mean, literally, I hear Christians talk all the time, and I know where that message came from, and it was somebody who hates God. And they're believing it. And they don't know it. So ask where your beliefs come from. And the problem is not learning from people who don't believe in God or who believe different things from you. Like there's lots of things to learn out there and lots of things to study. The problem is, is when somebody disagrees with God and you take their side. So continually ask, especially with the important stuff, where did that come from? Is that a trusted resource? Is that a trusted voice that I need to be putting at the core of what I believe? Secondly, put in the work to figure out what God really says in the Bible, especially if there's a topic you're wrestling with, if it's a hard thing and you don't know, then learn, set up, set up an appointment with Rachel or with myself and ask questions or um, do a Bible say about it or Google what does the Bible say about this and figure it out for yourself so you know. Don't assume. Don't even assume that what I teach you is like, test me, question me. I invite it. Come after me with your Bible and say, what about this, Josh? Not you, Paul. Everybody else but you. <laughs> Fine, you can do it, Paul. Uh. And finally, this is where it gets close to home. Look for areas of our life where we're telling lies about God. Let me give you an example. Um, bullying on social media. Bullying on social media is a lie about God. It's a lie about how God sees people. And it is out of control. And it is crazy. And I'm not talking about, you know, just kind of joking around with your buddies. I'm talking about trying to hurt people by the words that we say on social media. It's, it's devastating. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. Christians, whatever our reputation is, Christians should be known as people who don't bully on social media. That's what we should be known as if we were telling the truth about God. So look for ways, and we all have them, where our lives or our words are telling a lie about God. And you guys, the whole reason I'm telling you this is because I want you to experience the joy that comes with really loving people. And we live in a world that is so angry right now and so divided and confused and stressed out beyond anything that we've ever seen. We live in a world that responds in revenge and lies and all this different stuff. And, and I believe strongly that it's real love that tells the truth about God that is the power to cut through all of that and make a difference. I wanna show you a video clip of a, a man in court on a witness stand. And what happened was, is that his brother, um, and they're a black family, he's a black man, his brother's a black man, was in his apartment, and a white woman came home to the apartment, went in the wrong building, or the wrong uh, apartment, thought it was hers, it wasn't, and she pulled out a gun and shot this guy's brother and killed him. So completely unjust, 
uh, basically manslaughter or murder somewhere in there of this innocent black man. Now, I mean, if you watch the news at all, you know what happens with stuff like this, right? The, the whole country loses their schniz. And this brother on the witness stand, you can tell he's nervous and he's reserved and he's like trying to get these words out and it's a little awkward. But even in his nervousness, he is showing the woman real love, telling the truth about who God is at one of the most painful points in his life. And it's so cool. So I just want to share this with you and then we'll pray in close. I can speak for my. Could you imagine if that kind of love started spreading around our city and started spreading around our schools and our families, our youth group, our church, our community? Real love tells the truth about God. I want you to imagine that Jesus is sitting in this chair. Just imagine that for a minute. And imagine that he's in this chair. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And just ask him, is there a lie that I have believed about you? And what is it? And you may or may not get something on your heart, it's something that you can keep asking. It's good to keep asking, but maybe you will get something on your heart about a lie that you've believed. And if, if there's a lie that you believed about God... The second thing to ask is, teach me the truth about you. And teach me how to live that out. I'm just going to give you a moment to do this, and then I'll close in prayer. God, tonight, we just confess the lies that we've believed about you when we believe that you're harsh or you're always angry, always out to get us, that you're distant and cold, that you don't care about us. The lies that we could never live up to, the path that you have for us, the lies that we're not good enough, God, whatever the lies that are that are coming up in people's minds and hearts, I pray that you would just work right now. Bring change, bring truth, and help it to, to sink in deep so that we might go out into our world and really love people and show them the truth about you. We thank you for these stories that have been around for thousands of years that have taught millions and millions of people the truth of what you're like. Let us make these things the final word in our hearts about what to believe. In Jesus' name, amen.